I want to talk very briefly about uh, aviation surface observations. So um, I started looking into surface weather observations some time ago, and one thing that was interesting to me is to try and understand what we have today, to enjoy and understand what we have today. And in doing this, I came across a data set I put into Google Earth. This, this is the network of AWASs and ASOSs that the rest of the country enjoys. Um, and you can see it's pretty dense in the central and east part, it gets a little sparser in the west part of the uh, country. But okay. Now, so burn that density of stations in your mind for just a second, and I apologize for the color. Here's Alaska at the same scale as the other map. Here's our density of, of stations. And again, I apologize for the, the contrast, but it's, it's pretty sparse. And the numbers are, the rest of the country has over 1,800 stations. We have about 130, actually 133, I think, in Alaska. We would have to, if you just do the math, dividing the area out, we would have to have almost 200 more stations to have the same average density that the rest of the country enjoys today. Now, those of us that learned to fly here, grew up here, well, this is just normal for us. We didn't realize how deprived we were. Um, so file that away as a little detail. Now, it, it's even worse, though, because not only are these important to us for forecast, or for our pre-flight, you know, figuring out whether it's safe to take off and whether we should keep going or head for that alternate. Um, this is also the major input to the forecasters that generate our aviation weather forecast. So let's look at them for a little bit. Oh man, this is really, well, I think you can see it here fairly well. These are the, th we have three forecast offices for the Weather Service in Alaska, Juneau, Anchorage, and Fairbanks. And the shaded areas there, which are a little hard to make out, are their areas of responsibility for each of those. Um, and again, of course, superimpose the US. Now, if you look at that same thing, these little patchwork underneath, those are all the response areas of responsibility of the weather forecasters in the lower 48. Our three forecast areas cover the same area that have 68 forecast areas <laughs> in the rest of the country. There are a few more excuse me, than 40 forecasters in Alaska, there are about 400 forecasters for those same 68 areas. So it, it's more than just our weather observation network, the granularity of the weather information we get is also much less dense. Even though the products are kind of in the same format, look the same, they don't have the same informational content. And that's something that probably we all know, but uh, maybe we didn't know exactly that way. The final one is, this actually is looking, if you take one of the flight planning programs and zoom way out to the 300,000 foot level, this is the winds of law forecast grid for Alaska is forecast on a 90 kilometer basis for the rest of the country on it's a 30 kilometer basis. So right there you can get and see our forecasts, even though they, we learn the same things in pilot training school, doesn't have the same informational content. So I want to go back, and we could talk a lot more, and in future meetings we may, I hope, talk more about surface observation. So I want to take just one facet of this at the moment, and that is look at the APAID. Now APAID's a program, to the best of my knowledge, only is active here in Alaska. I don't think any of the rest of the country has any APAIDs anymore. These are, these are people in uh, generally remote parts of the state that have been trained, certified, they put in observation somewhere between six and 15 or so a day, depending on what station. Um, they don't observe, they don't make special observations when the weather changes. And of course, the real challenge is if they're either sick or, or leave their area for a while, there's nothing. Nonetheless, it's a lot better than not having them at all. So this is an element of our, of our network, which is diminishing, and, and there's an actual weather service program to make it diminish, and I won't talk about that today, but just again, to raise your awareness, this is a page straight out of the Alaska Supplement from 2011. Those were the stations available at that time. By 2013, look at the red lines, that's the number of stations that have been shut down, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, I think. And of course, more recently, 1st of October of this year, five more stations were, were shut down. The contracts were discontinued. So 
What I want to do is look briefly at what those stations that we just lost. Farewell Lake on the west side of the Alaska Range, a uh, fairly important station to some of us. Um, there's a pointer here, but, oh, sorry. Oh, central one. Central one, okay. So in this case, Merrill Pass West, again, kind of on the, just the west edge of the range, over the hills, so to speak, from Anchorage here. Um, out of Fairbanks, so here's Fairbanks, Manly Hot Springs, kind of halfway between Nanana and Fairbanks, an area where often the weather changes and on us. And then uh, in, and this is an interesting one in the uh, Copper River Basin. So here's Volcana. So Nebesna was just shut down. And of course, when I pulled these frames off the Weather Service's website, I realized, well, yeah, we'd already lost Slana and Paxson. And if you know what's going on in McCarthy, there's no observation in McCarthy at the moment. That's an area we hope to see a, an automated system. But so right now, we're real short on weather in this whole area. So, uh, and then finally, Chandelier Lake. Now this is north of Fairbanks, actually a Fairbanks to Dead Horse line is about here, and I know I personally, I mean, there are, there's a, a couple of houses, very small number of people that live here, but boy, I should look at that, figure out if I can fly direct over the Brooks Range to get to Galbraith Lake, Happy Valley, or Dead Horse, as opposed to having to go through Bettles through the mountain passes to get there. No more information at that location. So my question right now is, for these five stations, if these are in, at all have been important to you in the past, in the past, please send me an email. Doesn't have to be long, paragraph or something, describing which of them are important to you and why or how you use that information. I'm trying to get feedback right now so we can actually evaluate the situation and figure out how we want to address it. Now, I'm not thinking that we're going to see a paid observers back. That program is being phased out. But I am very concerned as we lose observations in areas that are important to us. And, but again, we need community feedback to, to figure that out. So with that, thank you very much. So I guess there's 30 seconds for questions if anybody has any. But I know you're anxious to get out of here, so I'll be happy to talk to people offline. Yes, Dave. Um, you mean more than just the weather cameras themselves? Yes. Speed, uh, temperature, I, I, the best answer I can give you is I don't know. I mean, I think there actually, in some cases, is some information there. But um, actually, the, the more likely thing, which again is a topic for another time, but the Weather Service is trying to bring in another kind of system that actually gives us the full suite of ceiling visibility, et cetera. It's called MOZ. The trouble is, it is not an FAA certified system. And there are, some, there are three of them out there right now, but they're not, between the Weather Service and the FAA, we have not yet shaken hands in a gentlemanly fashion and figured out how to identify them as METARs. And therefore, if you know exactly where to look, at, look for them, you can find them on the Weather Service's website. But if you're using ForeFlight or, or any number of these other flight planning programs, they don't appear. And so one of the things we're trying to do is say we need, we must figure out a way to have that information shared. Now, we presumably not put those at IFR airports where you're using them to shoot approaches, but these are mostly locations we need them for VFR operations. So that is work that's still underway. And that, to me, is the best promise for the future. Those units cost about half of a conventional AWOS, just as an idea of why they're so popular to the weather service. But so a lot of work going on. You'll be hearing more about this in the, the months to come. All right, thank you.